Over to you now, Gemma. OK, I'll just um, share my screen. You can see that, can't you? Uh, yes. Yeah, super. Yeah, so basically it took about 15 minutes, just very descriptively really, to take you through some of the content in the comic. And then if anybody wants to ask questions about how we did this um, and the and the impact and the outputs um, in terms of who we've collaborated with, please feel free to do that at the end. But it's um, it's based. It's a comic that bring. It's brought together researchers, uh, people who've done research across Bangladesh, um, South Africa, and then three projects I did: uh, one in Bolivia, one in Puerto Rico, and one in Barbuda. And we've kind of want. They're all all the stories or all the research is about very daily um, mundane ways that people experience the impacts of climate change and the small scale ways that they adapt um, and we've looked at rapid onset impacts from climate change slow onset we've looked at the the immediate impacts we've looked at the the long-term impacts so we try to give um, a diversity of um, how climate change manifests or how it impacts different people and the the premise is it starts in a classroom in Victoria. Uh, this is I'm not going to show you every page, but this is the second page in the comic. And you go into a classroom, and the teacher says, "Okay, we're going to learn about climate change today today because it's impacting people all across the world." And then we use different transition techniques to go into each context. So here they open up a textbook, and it says, "Right, how do people experience climate change in Bangladesh?" And that changes from her, you know, turning the TV on, there's a news report, or showing a newspaper article. So we use different ways to transition. So then you you head into Bangladesh, and this is just two pages from the four pages of the Bangladesh story. And that's research by Adiba focuses on how sea level rise in Kulna in um, has has contributed to the salinization of the local river. So with that, we wanted to think about how is it impacting women's everyday domestic duties? And we find that women are having to walk hours to another river where they can get, um, you know, um, un possible water, basically. We see women trying to harvest water. We see there's women or, who are trying to grow vegetables in buckets and sacks and uh, baskets because they can't grow vegetables in the soil by the river because it's too salty um, and then trying to bring through this idea that there are certain vegetables and plants that are um, salt tolerant and you see here with uh, the watermelons and a thing to think through when you're looking at this it's it's aimed at 12 to 16 year olds in particular and the Geography Teachers Association of Victoria have written a teaching resource to go with this. And I'll tell you a bit about that, but it's basically been sent out at the minute, the comic and the teaching resource. Then, then you transition into Cape Town in South Africa, based on Gina Ziervogel's work at the University of Cape Town. And that research is, is fascinating. It's all about how drought is experienced differently along racial lines. So you find that black um, populations live in housing with poor infrastructure which can burst the water pipes can burst a lot and during drought that's really problematic because the, the water terrace went through the roof so you have this dynamic where people's water pipes are bursting the cost of water is really really high and we try to show a little bit about how people try and tackle or that that everyday challenge going to the local the local um, ward councillor who would say it's your problem you you it's your house or even though the local government built the house so there's that tension about who has responsibility and then bringing the idea that people are collectivizing actually in the communities to try and gather their own information and data to lobby local government and again, this isn't all of the findings from that research. It's just what we wanted to hone in on particular themes and racialized experience of climate change is what we thought was really interesting in that context. The next place you go to is Bolivia in South America. 
in particular Cochabamba City, which is a medium sized city. And I did some research there on a hillside community which had a high population of indigenous Quechua uh, families who are typically very low income, socio politically marginalized. And they experienced a lot of landslides whipped up by increased rainfall by climate change. The story we focused on there was about migration. You know, this is the whole thing about migration as adaptation. You know, people can migrate overseas and they send remittances home and they can they can fund their own resilience. And in this case, um, women were going to Spain, sending remittances to invest in housing construction. But what we wanted to look at there was actually the emotional labor of that. Something we don't see is how this separation from children, this estrangement can be really difficult for relationships. Often children are left with grandparents who are burdened with this responsibility. Mothers' um, relationships with their children would change. So again, it's just getting at the idea of hidden impacts that we don't hear a lot about, um, but which make up the landscape of people's lives with climate change. Okie dokie. So the, and we talk a little bit about land tenure there. If you see on the, the top left hand corner there, they're, they're talking about, you know, we're not going to get, you're not going to get help from the local government because you don't have land tenure. And it's not, we're not shoving this in the reader's face. It's very, um, we're, we're relying on the reader's understanding or imagination or um, inquisitiveness to try and think about what's going on there rather than saying people who don't have land tenure will not get support from the local government. It's kind of you unpack the story as you go. The next the next context is Puerto Rico again where I did a one-year study after Hurricane um, Maria and the story is based on I think it's like four months after the hurricane. The theme here is all about food insecurity because there was plenty of food, lots of humanitarian relief was coming into the country. People were, you know, had an abundance of these um, relief aid meals and water, etc. But actually the nutrition of the food was really, really low. And the import of routine ingredients like chicken or vegetables decreased rapidly because there was this massive emphasis on relief aid. With that, the price of local food went through the roof really i mean it, i think it went up by about 40 to 50 percent um, for the first six months or the first five months after the hurricane so people lower income families couldn't afford that and with that you got parents who were worried about the nutrition of the of, of meals basically so in in turn you had women innovating recipes you know, instead of using chicken that they started using peas for a very um, traditional meal called asapo um, women collect mainly women to be honest in communities they collectivized and they started growing their own vegetables raising their own chickens as a way to kind of um, get access to nutritious food and to um, kind of undermine I, I i understood it as an undermining of the um, reliance on importing food and there's a whole story there about the colony colonization of diet food access to food with the united states because um, that's where most food is imported from but that's um, again another everyday impact food insecurity you know small scale ways that people adapt and you'll see that through the comic we focus a lot on women in particular, and that's a natural outcome of the research being based around the domestic space in particular. More women spend time at home, so we were interviewing more women across our different research projects. But saying that, the final context is in Barbuda, which is a really tiny island which makes up the twin island country of Antigua and Barbuda. And there was a huge hurricane in 2017 which devastated the island and there's been a and it's still ongoing a huge tussle over land rights because the land in Barbuda is communally owned it's a it's a colonial legacy that the land was passed over to the slaves so it's it can't be privately bought basically but after the hurricane there's this whole disaster capitalism dynamic where the government, which is dominated by the Antiguan side, was trying to get people to leave the island, 
and trying to claim that the land is actually privately owned and people were squatting. So that would open up a space to allow private businesses to build hotels and luxury resorts. But what's happening right now is there's a, there's a real collective resistance to that and the local community, which is only about 1500 people in a small village on the island, are working with international organisations, um, you know, experts in sustainability to argue that the area where they want to build the hotels is actually um, a natural heritage site because there's, a, there's the, the, the biggest habitat of frigate birds, the West Indian whistling duck. So again, that's all about um, disaster capitalism is the main theme. We talk a little bit about livelihoods, etc., and the psychological impact you can see there on the top left. But the main theme is disaster capitalism. So this is the final page that you see in the comic, and it's 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 kind of giving you an overview or to the students of where these places are in the world map. And although the stories are about climate change and everyday impacts about climate change, the there's a real politics of representation like throughout the comic. One of the, the main agendas we had was to try and um, shine a light or, you know, not give voice to, because I think that's sloppy, sloppy way of phrasing it, but to bring through the voice of people affected by climate change, because often you just see people who are in pain, there's raw suffering, there's a focus on um, representation of passivity or um, vulnerability. So we kind of wanted to bring through, yes, the, the the innovative or small scale strategies that people do, but also the fact that people have um, style in the way they dress, they have a certain way of speaking, they have, um, you know, they have uh, their own houses and the houses are made, made up of their own decor, which express their own taste and style. So that was a big part of what we want to do as well as to show students like a, a fuller spectrum of people who live with climate change. So there's the, the pedagogical side and then the politics, the representation side. And at this stage now, just sort of wrap up now, but at this stage now we've printed like 3000 copies. And if anybody actually wants a copy, you can come up to or down to floor 10 and I can give you some copies or packs of them if you're teaching climate change. But we're, we're giving out packs of 30 to geography teachers, not even geography teachers actually, high school teachers across Australia. And it's the Geography Teachers Association of Victoria Conference on Sunday, which I know Andrew Butt is heavily involved in organising. And the teachers there can pick up packs of 30. So we're, we're super excited, actually, um, about having it in the classroom to support the education of climate change, because there's quite a gap in climate change curriculum, because a lot of it is taught in high schools through STEM subjects without bringing that social science cultural, um, social, psychological impacts of climate change or how people live with it. So, um, yeah, that's kind of it. I'll, I'll just draw it to conclusion then. If anybody has any questions about how we made it or um, anything else, happy to answer. Thank you. Terrific. Thanks, Gemma. That was fantastic. Um, now, I'll open up the, um, uh, the floor to people who may have questions. Um, please just raise your hand. And um, I see some people getting applause. Well done. Um, yeah, and please raise your hand. Yeah, great, Erica. I'll pass over to you. Great. Hi, Gemma. Thanks for that. I really, really enjoyed your presentation, and I, I love your work. So I'm glad that you, you were able to present today. Um, just a question, actually. Have you had an opportunity as part of your work to um, share it with students already? And have do you have an idea of their feedback on it or their interactions with it? And I'm just so curious to know that. Oh, the short answer is no, to be honest. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, no, we haven't. But I've had it from the teachers. Um, we've had it from, I've had it from my previous comic, um, where it's been in schools and it was really well received and um, you know it's, it's not very British to be like tooting your own horn but we got a lot of good feedback from that first comic so that kind of gave me um, you know encouragement to do this second comic but specifics about how this one's been taken uh, don't know yet because it literally we only put it online about three weeks ago but that's a good point as well I think in the future 
if I was to do another like pedagogical comic, I would do consultations with students. We consulted with the people we did the research with, but that's a gap. We, I think we should do better. Great, thank you. Great, and um, over to Iris. Thanks, um, thank you, Emma. It was wonderful. I really like the whole, you know, I've, I've seen it before in links. And um, I wanted to ask, maybe you explained it somewhere, but I didn't hear today. Can you talk a little bit about how you got together with the other researchers and how you ended up doing this work with them? Yeah. Or alongside uh, them? I don't know. Yeah. So, um, so I, rich, I wanted it to do another comic and the idea was to have it as a global story. I wanted it to be able to, you know, cross from Australia across the globe to where I do my research, which is right on the other side of the world, which is Latin America. Um, so the premise was to go from a, a, a country in Asia and a country in Africa. And I wanted to focus on Bangladesh because this Bangladesh is is often seen in popular culture. And I think often the stories about Bangladesh, um, there's a, I mean, you could probably focus on any country about climate change, but I thought Bangladesh is a lot of research on Bangladesh and there's a lot we see a lot in popular culture and that idea of like trauma passivity um you know raw suffering is often front and center for you know the wider public and students so that was the choice around there and then I contacted Brack University um they have like a climate a, a governance and development department and I said is anybody interested in doing this and and they put me in touch with Adiba who's gr who's brilliant she's an early career researcher and she's fantastic and then for um the African continent I to be honest I know very little about climate change in Africa so I I thought instead of me trying to do my own research trying to find a particular person I put it out on Twitter and I said is there anybody is there an African scholar working on um, climate change impacts, everyday impacts climate change in the African continent? And the loads of people put Gina, um, like, and th th that turned out really well because she's she's quite well known in um, climate change research and um, you know Africa in, in broadly speaking. So it's great research and great networks. And again, there's loads of research on South Africa, and we also see that in popular culture. So uh, it was another way to try and challenge, you know, dehumanizing or essentialist or depoliticizing ideas about climate change in a context that people are familiar with. But in hindsight, you you could you could do any country, and I think in the future I would love to do more obscure or lesser known context. I think that would be like an, another really important thing to look at in future. Thanks, really great. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Iris. Thank you for coming. And do we have any other questions from anyone? I've got one, if um, no one else does. Um, so if you don't mind me asking Gemma, and um, then I'll hand over to Carl. How did you, because they seem quite, um, each of the examples are obviously very country specific, um, or at least um, that they're quite targeted in terms of what you've put into the comic. How did you identify what would be the, the priority scenario that you would apply to each country? Yeah. Um... So I already know I already knew from my three contexts what the themes were like what the what the key things I thought would be interesting to communicate and then um, I sat down with Adiba and Gina one on one we just sat for hours and they told me about the research like storytelling and I kind of had an overview then of the m multiple findings in their research, but then it was trying to think, okay, how does that differ from the other contexts? So it was really me having an oversight on all the different research projects and thinking, okay, let's not make, let's not um, repeat one another, but also what are some of the key debates in climate change research that we can feed into? So um, gendered impacts, we thought, okay, Adiba can do that. Migration is adaptation, I'm doing that. You know, I, I, identity, I think is really important. So we not just looking at gender, looking at race, because often that doesn't get talked a lot about in climate change. So it was like 
okay, I, um, Gina can do that. So it's just basically, I was kind of shifting things around based on um, what I saw as, as the differences and the similarities. Uh, yeah. yeah, terrific, thank you. So it's highly curated, I guess, in terms of yeah, what the stories are. Okay, I'll pass over to Carl. Thanks, thanks Gemma. Um, yeah. It looks, it looks absolutely great. I just found the link to download it. It's great that you've put it out there for, so people can share it and and access it. Um, I was wondering, have you thought about the like translating it into other languages? Like, I guess maybe three of those countries are Spanish speaking and yes. the whole population there. Absolutely. So we're doing that, and uh, and we're going to do it in Bengali as well. Um, the Spanish, the Spanish translation is interesting because the previous project I did, um, the previous comic I did was in Puerto Rico, and we got somebody from Puerto Rico to do to to do um, translation, so it was dialect. For this, we have to get um, somebody from Bolivia and uh, Puerto Rico, so the differences in Spanish because they 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 look so different how people speak, and then for the other contexts which are you know not native Spanish speakers I was like mm, what should the what dialect should it be because I don't want it to be Spanish from Spain because that whole colonialism of like um, that's you know that's the way Spanish should be spoken so we're still in debates about what would be the best the best country or the best dialect to go with but yeah it, it, we're translating it in in short answer Carl yeah that, that's very cool and it's a yeah I love love the thoughtfulness put into the approach yeah thanks Okay, um, are there any more questions from people? No? Okay, um, well, thanks, Gemma. I found that absolutely fascinating and really novel. Like, I think Erica posted um, in about the way of initiating a collaboration through Twitter. Like, what a great global outreach in terms of um, finding finding new people to collaborate with. So congratulations. And thank you also for the offer of being able to share the comics for people who might be interested in disseminating them as well. Um, uh, and just, just to say, like, um, there are there are physical copies lots of them have been printed and there's a load of them by my desk which i'm taking to the conference on sunday but if anybody wants a pack or one or anything just you can literally just email me and i can give you a load because we printed a lot <laughs> <laughs> you got three thousand to get through it's <laughs> no, terrific thank you and just a friendly reminder that the Kerr Forum is starting on a separate channel. So um, if you can attend that, that'd be great. That starts in about three minutes. So time to go grab a cuppa beforehand. Thanks again, Gemma. And thanks everyone for attending. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Bye. Oh, no worries. <laughs> See ya. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Bye.